These are your fast facts on the book of Hebrews. First, the book of Hebrews likely predates the destruction of the temple. Hebrews takes aim at the sacrificial practices of the temple in chapter 10, perhaps arguing against those who might feel inclined to revert back to Jewish sacrificial practices in hopes of reintegrating into Jewish culture. The author of Hebrews presses back against this idea, and this means that the book was likely written before AD 70. Second, the book of Hebrews functions as a series of synagogue sermons. Hebrews 13.22 uses the technical phrase, word of exhortation, to describe this epistle. This phrase is only used in Acts 13.15 when Paul was invited to preach in a synagogue at Pisidian Antioch. Given the subject matter and the frequent use of appeals, a sermonic genre makes the most sense when describing the book as a whole. Third, the book of Hebrews is full of Old Testament scripture. It contains about 30 quotations of scripture, primarily drawn from the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible known as the Septuagint. In chapter 8, verses 8 through 12, the author includes the longest quotation from the Old Testament that exists in the New, citing Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34. And not only does the author show deep familiarity with the Old Testament, but also a deep respect for it as the word of God. Fourth, the book of Hebrews is the sole anonymous book in the New Testament. Although some scholars would place our four Gospels in this category, each of the four Gospels has, as best we can tell, always circulated with a title indicating who wrote each one. Although their names were not in the body of the text, it's not accurate to suggest that the four Gospels are anonymous by any definition of the term. Hebrews does meet the standard of an anonymous book. It contains no mention of the author in the title or the body or or the conclusion. The book does not even contain the usual greeting or opening section of an epistle. As a result, for some time the book of Hebrews appeared both in and out of various canon lists that circulated in the early church. It wasn't until the Council of Hippo in 393 that Hebrews begins to show up consistently in canon lists. Fifth, the author of the book of Hebrews is a matter of informed speculation. Much speculation has been made over the centuries regarding the author of Hebrews. Although a host of potential authors have been suggested for the book, two prominent names have risen to the top. One, Paul. Paul's name has been associated with the book from its earliest days. In fact, its early circulation in manuscripts was alongside the Pauline manuscripts, perhaps lending weight to its addition into the canon. Much of the theology of the book matches that of a well-educated Jew who was comfortable speaking and addressing Greek-speaking fellow Jews. 2. Luke the Greek of Hebrews is a better match with Luke and Acts over Paul's letters. Many of the distinctive turns of phrase have led later scholars to suggest that the work is Luke's. I would combine these two theories. If Hebrews is a book of synagogue sermons, Luke likely heard and recorded many of Paul's sermons. These were later edited and collated by Luke as a track for Jewish Christians and Jewish seekers. Perhaps to gain a stronger hearing amongst these groups, Paul's name was left out of the title of the book. 6. Hebrews addresses Christ's superiority. In chapters 1 through 2, Christ is superior to angels. In chapter 3, superior to Moses. In chapter 4, superior to the Sabbath. In chapters 4 through 7, superior to Aaron. Superior to the Old Covenant in chapters 8 through 10. And Christ gives superior benefits in chapters 10 through 12 and produces superior behaviors in chapter 13. Christ's superiority is not emphasized in order to denigrate the angels or Moses or the Sabbath or Aaron or the Old Covenant, but to show that Jesus stands head and shoulders above all the rest. Seventh, what should we make of the warning passages? For some, the warning passages in Hebrews, in chapter 6 and 10, indicate that those who have trusted and have been saved through Christ may commit some sin of apostasy and end up falling away from faith in the future. If this is the case, one can never truly know whether they are saved in this life. In contrast, it's helpful to keep in mind two concepts. One, language of experience. These passages talk a lot about the experience of people who are part of a Christian community. They have tasted, they have been enlightened. It is quite possible to see this experiential engagement with Christianity as something short of true salvation. Two, real warnings. We should be careful not to try to explain away these warnings as something less than warnings. They truly do warn about the danger of false faith, and followers of Jesus should take them seriously as such. 
8. How does Hebrews parallel Melchizedek and Christ? The author of Hebrews calls on a figure from Genesis 14, who's also discussed in Psalm 110, in order to explain how Jesus can be an eternal priest who functions outside the line of Aaron and with deep roots going back before Moses all the way to Abraham. By pointing to Melchizedek, the author of Hebrews provides a picture or a parallel to the priestly ministry of Jesus and signals the end of the priestly function of Aaron's family. And those are your fast facts on the book of Hebrews. Thank you.